Hey, this is Matt Witte from the Matt Witte Realtor Team here for our next episode of Local Business Insider with good friend Roberto Herman. Did I say that right? What's up? You did, sir. You did. Wow. I am very impressed with your enunciation of a Spanish last name, even though you're from Lawrence, Massachusetts. Tell us what you're doing. That's right. Give me those questions so you could please the sponsors of your show. <laughs> Hey, thanks for having me, Matt. Pleasure to be on your platform. Roberto Germán from Lawrence, Massachusetts. Currently residing in Tampa, Florida after seven years in Austin, Texas. So I I've seen the real estate market all over the landscape here. <laughs> and there's plenty of opportunities, sir. Plenty of opportunities here in Texas if you you're trying to really expand the reach of the Witty team. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it. <laughs> well, happy to be here. Um, as you know, I'm a longtime educator and started out as an English teacher, worked my way into numerous administrative roles, last one being lead principal at Headwater School in Austin, Texas, and then transitioned to Florida. And in that transition, was inspired to go in a different direction. So I've been serving as an edu educational consultant. And while I've had the business, Multicultural Classroom is the name of my business. I've had it since about 2014. Never really took it off the ground. Never had the time because I was leading schools, invested in, in, in the schools in which I was serving and building schools and changing culture and putting out fires. And, and when you're doing that and you're not investing in your own business, it's hard for things to really take off. And so when we transitioned to Florida, I said, you know what, this is the time. I'm ready for a change, ready to work in a different manner, still within the realm of education, but working now as an entrepreneur. Yeah, it's very cool. It's a great description because I, I know we met a couple decades ago, and, and the first thing I see when I look at you is that you're an educator, and it sounds like you, you've done that and then just branched off, like you said, kind of into that entrepreneur space, but you haven't quite left your, your educational uh, background. No, not at all. You know, it's it's in me. It's it's part of what I do. And I work besides my wife, Lorena Hermann, best-selling author of Texture Teaching, a uh, framework for culturally sustaining practices. And so our work is focused on training school leaders, training teachers in anti-bias, anti-racist practices. We also work with nonprofits, for-profits, uh, various organizations that really want to work towards uh, understanding their own biases, because we all have biases, we all have prejudices, right? You know, it's just, it's it's the nature of things. The, and we won't get into the brain-based research, but it's the nature of just how things function and how we function and how societies function. And so we got to make sure that we're encouraging people to work against that, to the, dismantle the things that are harming us from truly being in community, right? And so we want to be uh, individuals that are building bridges in, instead of causing divides. Right. Yeah, very well said. And um, I know that that work probably started uh, all the way back to your days in Lawrence and, and, and your travels to Texas and now to Tampa. And um, maybe uh, I don't have this uh, question for you, but tell us some of the main differences that you've seen between uh, teaching in Lawrence and Danvers and then, and then switching over to Texas and then in Tampa. Yeah, I'll start with the similarities. And the similarities are that kids are kids, regardless of what school setting you're at. Young people have certain needs, depending on their age range and their grade range. They, they have these basic needs that have to be met. And so that's the great thing about working with a diversity of young people is that at the end of the day, there's still like a common goal in terms of what we're doing in our service to, to the young folks. Now, in terms of the differences, there, there are cultural differences, right? So Massachusetts, Texas, Florida, all very different places, all uniquely themselves. And that's a, that's a great thing because it provides a lot of learning experiences in terms of being in these different geographic regions, being around different people groups. So for example, when we went to Texas, uh, there were a lot of comments from folks in Massachusetts about like, wow, you're going down to Texas. What are you going to do down there? Is, you know, you're going to be all w w with cowboys and, you huh. know, is it all tumbleweed and, and people riding horses? And I'm like, 
folks, folks, are, y- are y'all serious <laughs> right now? Have you ever been outside of your own space? And and I get it because if I'm honest, I, I probably had a similar mindset mm-hmm. before I visited Texas a few times and was surprisingly different than what I had in my head, right? Or what was projected to me, whether through media or or just the people that I was around up north. Uh, Texas is wonderful. There's a lot of space down there. There's a lot of construction happening. There's there's a lot of diversity in terms of like what the regions look like. So for example, Austin is very different than Houston and Houston is very different than Dallas and so on and so forth. And so, but even in Austin, you know, you got the you got your, your metropolitan city, but even within that, you have the hill country. If you're going out more towards where the Salt Lake is at, and if if you if you come, um, then then you go some some other regions in Austin, in in which you're you're not necessarily in the hill country, but you're you're not in the city, and it's uh, it's just this beautiful blend. And so in that beautiful blend, you also have a, a beautiful blend of people, and and over there in Texas. There's strong Mexican uh, heritage and Mexican American presence. Uh, a lot of folks from a lot of different regions, also because people have moved. Uh, almost everybody from California has moved to Texas. Mm-hmm. But then you also have a lot of folks from north who who went down to Texas and established roots there. And so some of the differences I've seen is just maybe I'd say I just say in terms of the culture, that's the biggest difference, actually, in terms of the culture, culture in terms of food, culture in terms of the local history, and then culture in terms of just the way people uh, experience community in these different places. Awesome. That's great. And um, I know you don't want to talk about this, but I will bring it up. I know Roberto (laughs) hates the cold, so I know... um, and not to make small talk, but I know in Tampa, it got very, very cold, almost record cold. And I was wondering if it gave you a flashback to Massachusetts. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> and, and the answer, unless something extremely crazy happens climate wise in, in the future, is always going to be no. <laughs> no flashback. All right. This is Tampa. <laughs> Well, yes, people are complaining right now because it's about 68 degrees or whatever it is. And so by our standards over here in Tampa, it's cold. But, you know, I'm from Massachusetts, so you're not going to catch me complaining too much about it being 68 or 58 Mm -hmm. or even 48 to be. And it did get to 30, but that was like for two days (laughs) and we were absolutely fine. (laughs) And I was up north about two weeks ago, hmm. and that was terrible. <laughs> and the worst part of being back up north was my niece allowed the boiler to go all the way down. There was no gas in the boiler, which meant there was no heat yeah. in the space that I was staying. Right. And then she, she, she wasn't even staying there that weekend I was there. I was, oh, my goodness. I was not too pleased with my niece. Oh, that's too good. I was shivering and ready to get back to Florida as soon as possible. Massachusetts is beautiful in the summer. <laughs> I knew it was coming. So let's get into it, man. I know that uh, you got a, uh, your book is coming out late January. I've already pre-ordered it, and uh, I'm excited to read it. I was hoping you'd, you'd maybe text me some uh, some inside information, but I know you're a busy guy. So tell us about uh, your new book and, and Blue Ink Tears and uh, – what you're, what you're hoping your readers are going to get out of it. Listen, first of all, don't lie to your audience. I have texted you inside information. <laughs> I told you to look for this one particular poem, and I won't reveal the title or the content. That's true. Folks, you are right. I, I did Google it, and I couldn't get early access to that poem. You just, <laughs> you just told me I'd like it. <laughs> it well... <laughs> Inside information. I told you what to look for, and I told okay. you the title also. True. I'll now be, I'll be ready. Uh, the title of the book is "Blue Ink Tears." It's a collection of poems. It's something I've. It's it's a work that's been in progress over twenty plus years. It was really inspired in my early college days, around the year two thousand, and writing has always been an outlet for me. Writing has always been an outlet for me. Steve Kelly, actually, from the Lawrence Boys Club, was the one who 
kind of got me into it. And what happened was there was a young man. I was in seventh grade at the time. And Jose Tuto Hernandez, he was a ninth grader. And, you know, coming up through the boys club, a lot of us that played basketball, it was a fraternity, tight-knit community. And so Tuto was a student at Mount Cardigan, if I remember correctly, at the time. And he came home from, from break and was walking home with his cousin. He had a bike and somebody tried to rob him for his bike. Wouldn't give up the bike and the guy shot him. Wow. Uh, thankfully, he survived. And while he was in the hospital, Steve Kelly asked me to write a poem for Tuto. And I'm like, uh, okay. It, it wasn't like I was a writer. I didn't see myself that way. But hmm. Steve, to his credit, saw something in me that I didn't necessarily see myself at the time. And, you know, because Steve was my basketball coach and person I had a lot of love for him. Like, ah, right, Steve's asking me to do it. No, I'm going to do it. So I did. And, and that started my journey as a writer. And then when things would happen, um, not just tragic things, but oftentimes tragic things, things would happen. And that, that was my outlet. That became my source. Instead of turning to violence, instead of turning to the streets, and instead of turning to drugs and alcohol, writing became my main outlet. Wow. That's an amazing story. And, 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 I, and, and I've talked to you on many, many occasions about many different things, and, and I've never heard that story from you. And, and to find it, uh, to hear it here on this podcast for the first time is amazing. Um, even just trying to process all that and, uh, and uh, to come up with, with, with uh, you know, something to help a kid out that's, you know, in the hospital. He's obviously suffered a lot of uh, mental and physical anguish. And for you to reach out like that and to hear Steve Kelly's name, I know great, great pieces about him in a paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's obviously been, was very well loved in the, in the Lawrence area and, and beyond. And it's great to hear that story from you. And and uh, wow, it's uh, it's uh, pretty powerful where that started. So I, I was going to say, how did you originally come up with the content? But now I know I got that. Uh, that's pretty easy to see. And, and I mean, what were the early stages of the business like? So you're trying to get this book off the ground and you've you've developed all these poems over time, over years. And so maybe tell us like, well, A, how many poems do you have in that book? And maybe B, what was the early stages like and um, in terms of trying to get it off the ground? Yeah, yeah, great questions. So in, in terms of this collection of poems, how many? I don't know, to be honest with you. There's a lot. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers. Sometimes you start looking at something so much that, you know, certain details are just like, all right, I, I need a break in order to be able to step back. But I can tell you that there's the book's about 84 pages or so. 84 pages of content. And... Let's say there's probably, I don't know, 15, 30. Let, let's say there's probably around 45-ish, 45, 45 to 50 poems. Yeah, okay. that awesome. sounds right. That sounds right. And in terms of the business and, and growing the business and the initial stages and whatnot, uh, again, started the business in 2014. Did some consulting on the side, but it was very difficult to have a consistent schedule with clients because it evolved around my, primarily around my work schedule. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I'm working all the time as a school principal, as assistant principal, whatever the case may be, there's very little time for me to do consulting unless folks wanted to do consulting via phone in the evening. And sometimes that did happen. And my wife who I mentioned is also my partner in the business. I serve as the executive director. She serves as the academic director. She was getting more work and more interest, but she was full-time teaching. And so once the pandemic hit, we switched it up a bit, decided to have her go full-time on a business. She was also pregnant at the time. So we had a lot going on. You said, you know what? We, we need some flexibility. We, we need to be able to figure something out that's going to work for our family at the time. And so... We did that. And then once we moved to Florida a year later, then I transitioned. And so I've been mainly behind the scenes for the past few years in regards to our business, just doing all the executive director type work, working on the legal aspects of it, 
with our lawyer, uh, working with the CPA to make sure we're in compliance from an accounting perspective, mm-hmm. um, building our network, uh, learning, learning business practices, right? I mean, it wasn't like I was completely oblivious to things. My father was a small business owner, sales and repairs of home appliances, and I've dibbled and dabbled and stuff. But this was the first time I was like all in, Mm -hmm. as in, hey, our livelihood depends on this. Right. And so that's a different type of pressure, but one that we welcomed. You know, there's there's no journey that you're going to take that will not come with its own set of obstacles. And there's no journey that you are going to experience in which you will not encounter some sense of failure. Mm -hmm. And I've come to understand that it's it's okay to experience failure as long as you're willing to learn. As long as you're willing to learn and grow. Some people are afraid of failure. I'm not saying I like failure, but I've come to appreciate that in the process of failing at something, there's opportunity to learn and grow. And I'm all about growth, especially at this stage in my life and this stage in my career. And so that's what we've been doing with Multicultural Classroom is learning along the way, identifying our needs, identifying our strengths, identifying the individuals who could support our growth and development. Thankfully, we've had we have some great business coaches, Diana Benitez of Teach With Love Global, uh, Francesca Escoto. Robert Kaplinsky, we have some wonderful people who have been supporting us and continue to support us. And as we learn and grow, we're supporting others who are interested in taking similar steps, but perhaps don't know necessarily where to start or they're stuck in the early stages. And so uh, now we transition or I'm transitioning to, hey, not being fully behind the scenes and figuring out, well, what supports do we need in order to ensure that the stuff that I do as an executive director gets accomplished while I'm really occupying more space in creator mode. Mm -hmm. Um, My wife and I are content creators, and and part of the content we we create, besides social media content, obviously, I'm a well, you know, I'm a podcaster. I'm the host, a creator and host of the Our Classroom podcast and educational podcast. And so with this means there's more time spent, more engagement in terms of connecting with the audience, doing author visits, not just to schools, but libraries, coffee shops, other places in which I'm able to share my work, do my readings, perform some of my poems, engage people in dialogue as it relates to love, relationships, justice, and identity, which are the major themes that I cover in this book. That's amazing. I mean, talking about the pandemic and and you have these, you know, not a cushy job, but you got these cushy jobs. You got you got these jobs where you know the checks are coming in. You're like every Friday, Lorena and I get paid and things are good and safe. And then you say, you know what? Now we're doing this. And I know it wasn't as abrupt as that, I'm sure, but Uh, A lot of people talk about what they're going to do. You know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And they do the planning and the planning and nothing ever happens. And then you guys just take action. And like you said, your your livelihood, your children's livelihood, your family's livelihood is is on the line. And you're out there in a historic time. And what an exciting thing. And now you got the you got the book launching. And what was what was some of the roadblocks getting that on Amazon? Because. I naively think, oh, you just called Amazon, put the book on, and I know it's not that easy. So tell us a little bit about the roadblocks and how you overcame those. Yeah, yeah, great question. So my wife and I have some experience because this is the third publication for us under Multicultural Classroom. So the first was the Anti-Racist Teacher Reading Instruction Workbook. It's a book that my wife wrote. We self-published it. We didn't know what we were doing, but said, you know what? We're going to publish this book because it's great content. And we're the type of individuals that we're not going to sit back and simply complain about something. Mm -hmm. If we see a problem, not only are we going to identify the problem, but we're going to try to come up with some potential solutions to that problem. There's a lot of complainers in that in the in the world. All right. We have more than enough complainers. We need people that are actually action oriented, solution oriented. And so. So you know what? 
I think we could do this better. And that's that's been our mentality. We've seen trainers come into numerous schools and districts that we've served in. And we're like, this training was weak. This professional development was weak. Mm -hmm. Now we could just keep saying it's weak or we could go and do something about it. You know what? Let's position ourselves. Let's let's start offering training ourselves and see if people want the service and see if they're responding positively. And, and if so, we're going to keep going with it. We're going to make our adjustments. We're going to get better. Same thing with this process of publishing books. We just, we talked to my sister-in-law about it. She was encouraging us because she's a business coach, gave us some tips on how strategies we could use to engage our audience. My wife has a big platform. She has a big following via Twitter and some of the other spaces through her work because she's a co-founder of Hashtag Disrupt Techs, uh, literacy movement. And so we leveraged her platform, figured out how to create a website, started marketing our, our business multicultural classroom. Our first website was terrible, <laughs> but we had one. Mm -hmm. And and that's part of the point is that like, sometimes you, you might not have perfected the product. And even this, even with my book, I'm not, this is not a perfect product. It's never, especially as a writer, you, I think a lot of writers probably feel this way. I definitely have always had it in my mind that perfection is exaggerated. Mm -hmm. As soon as I publish this bad boy, I'm going to find something that could have been better. Right. Something I could have adjusted, or maybe I should have added this poem, or maybe I should have said things this way. But that's that's part of the process, and you got to live with it, and you got to be okay with it, and then you got to move forward and do better, figure out how to do it better. And so... After we published her first book, she thought it would sell. She thought it would sell fifty copies, and she she would have been happy with that. Mm -hmm. I thought it would have sold five hundred, and I would have been happy with that. We're three years in, and it's still selling thousands of copies. Amazing, grace of God. And so we've learned from that. It opened up a lot of doors and opportunities, a lot of interest. Uh, people having her as an individual and us as a business come in to do trainings or for that product. And so, you know, then thankfully we had an opportunity for her to get a publisher deal. And her second book came out through a publisher, Heinemann, Heinemann Publishing and Texture Teaching has done extremely well. And we've learned a lot through that process too. And there's pros and cons to going the independent route versus going with a publishing house. I won't get into all of that because that's probably a whole nother conversation, mm -hmm. a whole nother episode. But the point is you learn from all of it. You learn from all of it. I'm not necessarily going to say that this approach is better than that approach. They have their pros and their cons, but you have to extract what it is that you need in order to move forward and do better. So that's what we've done. And this, this product, we're moving independently. We're not going through a publishing house because, first of all, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. I'm, I'm talking about real experiences in this book. This is not fabricated stuff. Everything that I'm putting in here, it's happened. It's happened to either me directly or people in proximity to me. You might even be in this book. I hope so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you got your copy on the way, so you'll you'll find out. I want an autograph copy, so I know that when you come back up here, you're gonna you're gonna knock on my door with no notice, and I'm gonna have my book ready. Well, you know when I come back up, that we're gonna do lunch, and you're probably gonna pay. What do you mean, probably? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll Matt, let you pay you since you guys have your third book coming out. I'm gonna let you pay. I always feel like I should pay since you come visit. Uh, you know, I will graciously cover the bill. I know you will. Even th even though I know the Matt Woody team is doing extremely well. <laughs> I, I, I see you, you're expanding. <laughs> expanding uh, from uh, town to town, for sure. So this is, <laughs> this is a great story, man. And I, I got I to ask you a well, couple let, let, Well, let me no, add the ahead. piece about, let me add the, piece about the, the challenges. So I, I think in this day and age, there are so many great resources available that it's almost like I don't well, I don't want to say anybody could do anything, but a lot of people can do a lot of things, whether it's creating your podcast, as you have done and I have done. Mm -hmm. There's so many platforms, right? Riverside. Mm -hmm. There's there's um, Squadcast. Mm -hmm. There's all type. You know, 
all types of platforms for you to create in, in the area of podcasting. As it relates to publishing books, there's a lot of great resources, whether you're going through Amazon KDP or you're going through Ingram Spark. There's a lot more resources now than there were back then. And that was part of my challenge is that when this when I was first inspired to to write this book and, and put it out, I was in college. It was early 2000s. I was working two or three jobs while being a full time student. And I just didn't understand how to get it done. Mm -hmm. I also didn't have the financial resources. I didn't have the network that, that I have now. I didn't have anybody guiding me. I was just trying to figure it out. And I was just like, you know what? Maybe this just ain't the time to do it. Maybe I just got to focus on the other things I'm doing as it relates to making music and coaching basketball. And there, there were a lot of other areas in which I was having success. And so the book got got put on hold. And, and then there was always a reason to put it on hold. Hmm. Oh, I just... I just stepped into this new role as a teacher. I just stepped into this new role as a basketball coach. I just stepped into this new role as a school leader. There was always re a reason to put things on hold. And at some point, you got to say enough. Mm -hmm. If I want to see this happen, it has to happen. And I have to, I need some accountability around this. And so it's happening now. These are the dates. This is the deadline. This is the team. These are the individuals I need to support the different areas. And we're just going to make this happen. And the last piece I'll say is that you have to be willing to invest in yourself. And sometimes you're you're the biggest roadblock, right? So in my case, it was like, well, it costs too much. Mm -hmm. I don't like the printing costs or it's going to cost me too much to, to get a designer. It's always something, right? And so... If you're not willing to invest in yourself, then nobody else is going to invest in you either. All right. You got to have some skin in the game. And thankfully, I, I just got to a place where I'm like, you know what? I think I got the best product. And I'm not waiting for anybody's validation in order to make this happen. I'm not waiting for the publishing houses. I'm, I'm not waiting for big time authors to give me the stamp of approval. I'm not waiting for anybody. I'm going to make this happen because my words matter and I know they have an impact. I know it. I know it. I know it. I know it from the work that I've done. I know it from, from seeing the way my presentation and my words have impacted young people and inspired young people. Even when I didn't realize it at the moment, sometimes they just circle back years later. I'm like, Oh, Mr. Hedman, remember when you said this? Hey, coach G, remember when you said, I'm like, and you know this about me. I don't remember a whole lot of things. <laughs> Be like, man, no, I don't. But thank you for sharing that. Right. Yeah. Because it's it, it encourages me to keep going. It does, and it also knows that you're you're given you're given genuine words to genuine people, people that you love, and and you're not thinking like, hey, I'll remember that the rest of my life. But they're so touched by that, you know. And you're just you're an inspiring person in general. I mean, the way you uh, deliver your message is amazing, and. And I know you're not on Audible yet, but I, I know once you're on Audible, if you don't read yourself, I'm not listening to it. If you hire someone from Audible, because you can, as you know, I'm not buying it. If you're reading it, I'm going to buy it. You you know me better than that. <laughs> you know me better than that. There's polite. no way I'm paying somebody to read my words. It's polite. They're not going to get it, <laughs> they, they, get it across the way I'm going to get it across. No. No, a hundred percent. I think that's that's super important. I mean, do you have you know, do you have a favorite poem in that book? Something that really that, resonates with you more than anything else? I know I'm sure they're all amazing and they have different meaning, you know, in your life. But is there one that you're like, man, that's the one that that's just the one that's got to be first or last? Or I'm tempted to say that they're all amazing, also, but I'm I'm not going to. I'm I'm not. <laughs> Because they're not all amazing. Some of them are actually more amazing than others. <laughs> but in terms of my favorite pieces, to be honest, it depends on the day. You know, because they they speak to you in different ways. And I, I'm hopeful the reader's going to engage with the text in the same way. That if they read one poem on this particular day, it really catches their attention and they really feel connected to it. But on another day, depending on what they're going through, 
that it might be another poem that calls their attention. So for me, the several of them do. My father died in February. So we're going on on the 17th of February to mark the year of his death. So I have two pieces in this in this text that one is dedicated to my father and, and one is capturing his final moments and our final and when I say our I'm referring to me and my sisters, our final moments with him. Huh. And so those pieces are really, you know, in the process of 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 grieving and mourning, right? We I'm I'm grieving, but I'm grateful. For and sure. those those pieces, they're really speaking to me in this season. And then there's another piece, the City of Promise, which is about our, the city that we're from, Lawrence, Massachusetts. People say a lot of things about Lawrence, but if you know, you know. And I'm from Lawrence, and you're from Lawrence, and we represent that, and we represent it well, which is why it's important to, to have such platforms so people can hear from us directly and get to know our stories and highlight our successes. Because there's there are so many success stories that come from the city of Lawrence. Hundred percent. And, and so that piece, City of Promise, it, it's one that I hold dear to my heart because I carry Lawrence with me wherever I go. Yeah, you always have, and I and I believe that, and I'm proud to say that I, I'm from Lawrence as well. And uh, it's uh, you know Central Catholic graduates here. Just a little shout out. That's right, ninety nine. You do it was coming. I won't give you my year. It's all good. It's all good. But you know, it is. Yeah, 100 percent. So very very well said and uh, you know, I can't I can't wait to read this read, read this book and and I'm not uh, you know me know me a long time. I'm more of a math guy, but I am definitely going to to dig into this and I'm glad they're poems and it's not a 500 page book. If it was, I'd still read it. <laughs> you know that. But give us uh, some info on the release date. Where can they pre-order it? I know we talked a little bit about it, but just maybe to refresh some memories. Yeah, and as Matt stated, we're Central Catholic alums, and so we appreciate the support. I'm thanking Central in advance because I know they're going to purchase copies for, for their students, you know, school-wide, or at the very least a class set. How about that? I don't know what the budget's looking like at Central, but it's, it's looking, a it's lot looking of good. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. I saw the tuition lately, <laughs> and I and I was in the building a couple years ago when – when they had the anniversary for the school's first state championship basketball team, which I think you I were on that, weren't you? I, I think I was. I think I was a tri captain. I think I was a tri captain. And so, uh, yeah, thank you in advance to Central Catholic for the bulk order purchases that you're going to make. <laughs> I love that. Uh, in, in terms of release date, the the date is January 31st. Okay, awesome. Now, in in the process of publishing books. There's always things that come up that may delay the release date, but the final proofreading of the book took place and was completed today. And so now it's really about us just tightening up a few things as it relates to the formatting and running a couple copies by the print to ensure that everything comes out the way it's supposed to come out. Right now, we're hopeful to stay on track with January 31st. But if not, then it would be the following week, which would be the first full week of February. Okay, that's amazing. And, yeah, go ahead. Yes, and it'll be available via my website, multiculturalclassroom.com. You could actually pre-order right now. And you can also purchase the book through Amazon. We know a lot of people use Amazon as their shopping platform. So it will be available for physical print uh, via Amazon, Amazon Kindle. If you use Kindle, then you could purchase through Amazon and it will also be available audible um, in audible. Okay. So awesome. Every, those are everywhere. Uh, all the formats. Uh, you could, you could also download the audio version via my website. Um, the audio version is not done yet, but we are scheduled to do the recording this week. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so that's that's awesome. I can't wait to read it. I'm sure uh, the viewers here are going to jump on and order the book as well. It's, you're an inspiring person, and, you know, it's it's so much fun to talk to you. I told you this could take four hours, so nobody knows how much we actually edited. Um, but this was so good. And how can people reach you? 
you know, Instagram yeah, or absolutely multicultural classroom across all platforms. Again, multicultural classroom across all platforms. So that's Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, TikTok, and then on Twitter, Roberto Germán, R Germán twenty twelve. All right, at R Germán twenty twelve via Twitter. So very accessible. Follow our content, share our content. We're really busy in the work of engaging people in critical conversations about education and about dismantling systems that prevent us from being in harmony with one another. So we'd appreciate the support. And again, you can purchase Blue Ink Tears via our website, multiculturalclassroom.com. And then once it's published, end of January, beginning of February, it'll also be available on Amazon. Amazing. Roberto Armand, thank you so much for joining us. It's great catching up with you as always. I'm excited to see where uh, your business leads you in the future. And uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, Matt, thank you. I appreciate being on your platform. You've been a great friend. You've been a good resource in terms of picking your brain as it relates to all things real estate. Uh, love to chop it up with you about that and very happy for the success that you're having with the Matt Witty team. Always awesome. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. We'll talk soon. All right. Take, Take care. care.